Good morning, good morning. Please feel free to turn on your cameras, say hello in the chat. Um, I'm going to try to keep things pretty um, informal, given that we are in this Zoom space and not in a regular classroom. So it's a little bit harder, you know, to make sure everyone's participating, especially for those who don't have cameras or, you know, a way of uh, verbally participating. Or I know some of you are even at work. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm so glad you're in the class. Um, one other announcement, though, is that um, some of you might have seen that there was a typo on the schedule. I also want to dedicate a little bit of time to answering any questions people might have about the Canvas setup um, of this course. Um, and then we can get right into the content because there's a lot of stuff already this first week that we have to talk about. Um, so the big things that we're going to focus on um, when we meet together uh, I'll try to give you like a highlight of the most important topics, right, that we covered throughout the week. And then I really want this space to be an opportunity for me to answer questions for you, because <clears throat> if you've had a chance to look ahead, you'll notice that there's already a lot of recordings and lecture materials available to you. Um, and I don't want to waste our our 50 minutes a week just reading that to you, <laughs> right? So um, the intention is that, you know, you've gone through at least enough of the content before you come into class, you know, into this space on Thursdays, and you have some questions that you can ask, right? Some some clarifying uh, way that we can discuss the material such that it's not, again, just me just talking at you for 50 minutes. <laughs> so I'll probably do a little bit more talking today since it's the first day. But in general, uh, and down the road, please make sure to have as much of the content completed for Thursday as possible so that I can answer any questions you have. If that's not possible, of course, you can email me, right? Um, if you have any questions, we can set up office hours, things like that. Um, so let's start off with any questions you might have about Canvas and the way that it's set up. So. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, and or if you have a video, you can raise your hand on the screen, or if you want to use the gesture, you can raise your hand. You can type your question into the chat. But So we're starting off with questions that you might have about Canvas for this course and the way things are set up. Okay. So some people might be taking a minute to type their questions in, but I'm not seeing any uh, visual indicator of questions. Okay, so I'm going to uh, move on from that, but I will just say that um, I set up Canvas in a chronological order, right? So I try to make it as intuitive as possible. And you'll notice that um, although this class is hybrid and has an asynchronous component, I do try to recommend, uh, you know, when you should space out the work. That's, you know, just my attempt to help you guys manage your time, but of course, feel free to go through the content in you know whatever pace fits best with your schedule. Ah, yes, good question. So Zoom recordings available after the meeting. Um, I have not typically made these available because I would have to get everyone's permission in the class to do that. But if it's something that enough students are interested in, I can send out um, a sort of like permission Google form <laughs> and uh, get consent and then for those who don't want to be on screen they can just mute their video and things like this uh, during class so uh, i'm not planning on having those available but um, if there is a demand i can i'm absolutely willing to explore that option uh, so thank you for that question good other questions about the course mm -hmm. all right so hopefully um did the announcement come out already about the course structure did you all have a chance to take a look at that? Yeah, great. So that just tells you, you know, that not everything I've put in the modules is required, right? So basically it's like a, don't be so overwhelmed. <laughs> it's a, I know it's a lot. It looks like a lot, a lot of content, but really the goal with the um, supplemental, the extra, the optional stuff is that I'm trying to provide, you know, things that are not just from another textbook, right? I'm trying to cater to different learning styles, right? Um, and also connect, the stuff that we're going to be talking about to more current events, right? So we are going to be studying, obviously, women in world religions. But if you know anything about major world religions, 
you will know that they have been around for a very long time and they don't remain static, right? They change over time. And so the way that women are viewed in a particular religion is always going to be within a historical context, right? And so that's going to change. And the book and, you know, most of the research, of course, focuses on the past, right? The history of the way these traditions have viewed women. And we want to connect that as well to today, right? Because a lot of these traditions are still very prominent and widely practiced, but the views have changed and we want to acknowledge that work, right? So the media is trying to bridge that gap between history and sort of our contemporary present, right? And make this sure that this content is still um, relevant, right? Uh, to the way that we're experiencing the world. So I see we have some questions about the class, wonderful. Um, so what is my policy on late work? Excellent question. I will say that I have a pretty lenient policy about it, uh, meaning that you can submit work at any point before the end of the term. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be some penalties in some cases. So um, my late policy is actually in detail on my website. So I'm going to share the link with you in the chat. This is also linked in the syllabus. But the basic rule of thumb is that um, if you submit work late or are missing pieces, like it's incomplete when you submit it, you just have to do a little extra work to make up the late point deduction, right? So it's just trying to make sure that it's fair to the students who turned it in on time, right? And so if you submit it late, you will get a deduction if you just do whatever the original assignment was, but you can make up those deducted points by answering additional questions from the discussion, right? So there's detailed information in the policy. Um, I will tell you, though, that there is no deduction for um, late quizzes, but <laughs> don't wait to take them all at the end of the quarter, right? That's going to be terrible for you. <laughs> so um, even though there's no penalty for taking the quizzes late, I would encourage you to try to take them at, soon after we've gone over the content, right? So even if you don't get it done by Sunday night, which is when they're all due every week, um, you know, don't put it off because you'll have forgotten a lot of that information by then, or you're just putting a lot of work on yourself, right? Having to cover a, an entire quarter's worth of content all at the last minute. So um, yes, very flexible late policy, but I still encourage you to try your best to keep up with the timetable as it has planned out um, so that it doesn't become too overwhelming. Uh, next question, best way to contact me, uh, email. Um, either directly, um, you can find my email address in the campus directory. Um, but if if you've figured it out for most faculty, it's the first letter of your first name, your last name at mail.greenriver. Or wait, no, you guys have mail. We don't, right? <laughs> I think that's the difference. So I'm at greenriver.edu and students are at mail.greenriver.edu. If remembering or finding emails is like too much for you and <laughs> you're not interested in that, you can also just message me directly through Canvas um, and I'll get alerted through that. Um, I will say, though, that I am trying very hard to get as close to something like work-life balance as possible, if that's even possible. <laughs> and so um, I am trying not to check my email, you know, after a certain like five o'clock at night, right? <laughs> trying not to answer it on the weekend. So um, just make sure that you're keeping that in mind when you are doing your work, right? So if you send me a question about the discussion that's due Friday night, Friday afternoon, you're probably not going to get an answer in time to submit the work on time, right? So just make sure that you're thinking about those things um, as questions come up. Even if that just means taking a look at the instructions ahead of time, right, and not necessarily doing the work early, but so you can have an idea of what uh, sort of assistance you might need. Good. Any other questions about the course? No? All right, so again, feel free to type them in the chat if they come up. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears and uh, go over or introduce the main things that um, we are covering this week. And like I said, it's a lot. So there are basically four major conceptual themes, right? So if we focus on the concepts, the ideas, um, the first one is just what is philosophy, right? And so for this, um, I assigned a really short reading by Bertrand Russell. And he is going to provide a, a really, I think, important account of what philosophy is and does such that it is going to set up appropriate expectations for the course, right? So um, as you hopefully noticed, 
Um, I'll just, if, if any of you can turn on your cameras so I can see more of you, that would be very helpful. If not, you can, uh, again, use your gestures. But just a show of hands. Um, so he talks a lot about questions and answers, right, in this reading and the role of philosophy in that. So just by um, a show of hands, how many of you think that uh, Bertrand Russell thinks that the value of philosophy lies in the answers? Show of hands. That answering the questions is where we get the value of philosophy. Okay. See one, two, okay. Right. And now a show of hands. How many of you think that, according to Russell, the value of philosophy lies in the questions themselves, not so much the answers? Good, good. Right. So, yes, as much as, you know, we're going to be exploring answers in this class to various philosophical questions, I, I tend to agree with Russell. I think the value of philosophy is not so much in finding the one correct answer, right? But in exploring as many possible answers, right, that are out there as, as we can, and maybe even coming up with new possible answers, right? If the ones that have been um, proposed thus far still seem problematic. And so I wanted to give you an example of what that looks like, right, in our daily life, right? Because um, obviously we want answers to our questions. Knowledge is important. We're not just asking the questions for no reason, right? Surely answering them is going to be important. But we can think of it like this. So I'm, let's say I'm in my, my mid-30s now, and I've been teaching for about a decade, uh, which feels like a really long time. Um, but, you know, I, I've arrived at certain you know, levels of comfort in my teaching, right? Things that I've found that work really well for me. Um, but I still think it's very important to continue to question my own teaching methods, right? And I think Bertrand Russell is going to give us a good account of why someone, why I should do that, right? Why any of us should do that. And so the idea is that if I decided today, right, at this very moment, that, okay, a decade in teaching is pretty good, right? <laughs> I'm sure some people might consider me an expert after that amount of time. So what if I decided today that I have figured out what it means to be a good teacher, right? I've answered that question, right? So the idea is that would I actually be a better teacher if I decide I know the answer to that question or if I never decide I've come up with an answer to that question, right? If I continue to constantly feel like there's more to learn, right? There's more to explore. And it seems pretty obvious, right? That I would be a better teacher if I don't decide I know the answer, right? Because whatever I have relied upon today might not work tomorrow, right? Or maybe it's not working as well as I thought it was, or, you know, student demographics change and education change, right? There's, we have to adapt to things in the world. So this is the basic idea, right? So maybe think of something in your life that you have maybe always thought you knew the answer to this question, right? And maybe you think, is it worth exploring some more, right? Might I, might I continue to ask the question? And in this case, I want to, you know, encourage us all to maybe get back in touch with our youthful curiosity, right? When our kids were so curious about the world and we love to ask questions, maybe too much, right? So uh, we often encounter a world that is not always available to answer those questions, right? And so we get sort of like, well, that's just the way it is, or that's the way it's always been, or because I said so, right? <laughs> if you're dealing with an authority figure, right? And so we tend to become less comfortable asking questions. And some people even see asking questions as a sign of disrespect, right? That you're questioning their authority, right? In so, on something or uh, obviously in terms of religion, right? Which we're going to be talking about a lot in this class, questioning someone's faith, right? Feels like some sort of um, threat, right? Or, or potential threat in some way. And I want us to approach asking questions differently than the way we've been taught to view them, right? And I want us to recognize that if you were to share something about yourself, your beliefs, your opinions about something with someone, and they didn't ask any questions, what might that signal to you? Anyone want to share? You can share in the chat. You can unmute yourself. If you shared something that was important to you and someone and 
the person or people that you shared it with didn't ask any questions. How would you interpret that? It would make me think that. Uh, uh, Oscar. Like I would think there would be. Excellent, right? So we seem to be aware, right? That that is a very intuitive interpretation of someone not asking questions. But that doesn't seem to fit with the idea that asking questions is somehow disrespectful, right? So I want to encourage you to follow your intuition on this, right? Asking questions is absolutely a sign of interest, right? Even if your question is somewhat critical, right? Because that potential critique could give that individual a chance to defend themselves against it, right? And maybe even now put them in a stronger position to make their case, right? So even when our questions are viewed as antagonistic in some way, right? Or pushing back or critiquing or objecting or um, anything that might be seen as a threat to the truth of that position, right? We don't want to necessarily respond to it as a threat, but as an opportunity, right? An opportunity to provide better defense of our positions, right? Or to explore other possible um, avenues. Excellent. So I got, um, yeah, good. Molly, I want to come back to that. Just a quick question though, or uh, about the required textbook for the course. Yes, so um, I made, uh, I fixed the announcement. Apologies for that. The correct information is in the syllabus is now in the announcement. Good. Yeah, so Molly, do you wanna talk to us a little bit about your experience? Um, Cause I've had a student with similar experiences and they weren't even questioning God's existence. They were super excited to bring arguments for God's existence to their Bible mm -hmm. study. But the mere fact that they wanted additional support or proof for God's existence was seen as problematic. And so they were kicked out <laughs> of the study group. Yeah. To piggyback on that, I think it does a disservice to the religious traditions themselves. And the fact that so many influential thinkers, right, even within Christianity, Judaism, Islam, right, the, um, the monotheistic, the Abrahamic traditions, there's such a rich history of people committed to the church but who yes. are willing to engage in these ideas, right? And so it's, I think it does a disservice to, you know, not even familiarize ourselves because we know that the priests have to, right? They have to study this stuff. They go to see a lot, you know, they get degrees in theology um, and that's what theology is. Uh, so you'll see this in the lectures, right? As distinct from, but related to philosophy of religion, right? So philosophy of religion is going to be similar to theology in that oftentimes they're asking the same questions, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a God? If so, what is that God like? What does it mean for us, right? Does it mean that we have an immortal soul? Does it mean that there's an afterlife? What does it mean in terms of things like good and evil, right? So the very famous problem of evil, right? So there's so many amazing questions that they study <laughs> and yeah. they bother to learn, right? The good answers and the not so good answers to those questions. So yeah, it, it doesn't seem even authentic to the tradition, the religious tradition to prevent people from asking those questions. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so the different, oh yeah. And so the difference between philosophy of religion and theology is going to be where we're starting from when we answer those questions, okay? So if you are a theologian, you are already committed to a particular religious tradition, typically, right? Unless, um, I'm not sure if there's like secular, theological study? There might be. Um, there's definitely secular, secular means non-religious, right? So secular, um, uh, you know, religious studies, you can study the religions of the world like we're doing in this class without being committed to any one of them, right? Um, so that is possible. But typically in theology, you're already committed to a particular religion, it's set of doctrines, right? Um, rules, beliefs, right? Things, things that are held up as true or uh, dictate the way we ought to live our lives. And the idea is that if you're a theologian, you're going to answer those questions from that starting point, right? So already presuming that, say, um, the religious texts of whatever religious tradition it is, right? You're already presuming that those texts are true, right? So when a Christian theologian, right? and a Muslim theologian answer questions about God's existence, right? They're going to often use their respective religious texts, right? The, typically the New Testament, right? The Quran to support their answers to those questions, right? Now, from what you have all gathered about uh, philosophy in this first week, do you think that philosophers are going to have the same starting points when they answer these questions about 
God and the similar ones. Blaine, no, yeah. I was gonna say, <laughs> no, probably not. I think the idea is that the process to to figure out their answer should be similar, but maybe not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, a philosopher would definitely argue that they should be similar. <laughs> uh, they won't necessarily, because again, they're gonna be having these different starting points. So while they're gonna be answering the same questions, and uh, again, you could be a philosopher of religion who is dedicated to a specific religion, right? So there are a lot of, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist philosophers, right? So they're already part of the religious tradition, but they don't consider themselves theologians because they don't start off by assuming that their religion is true. They start off from where all philosophers start, which is that we assume nothing is true, <laughs> right? So we have to prove everything. We don't take anything for granted, right? And so if you are a philosopher of religion and you wanted to argue for the existence of a Christian God, you would first have to prove that a God exists <laughs> and then that it is the Christian conception of God, right? Rather than these other conceptions, right? So that's different from starting off from the presumption, right? that the Christian God exists based on biblical texts, right? So do we see that difference here? It's a difference of starting points and presumptions of what is true. And so the philosopher is not going to presume anything is true, right? But start from presuming nothing and then build from there. And so what's interesting in that case is that often philosophers of religion will come up with very different views of God, of what is morally right, of what the afterlife should be, than what you find in religious texts, because their reasoning makes them arrive at different conclusions. Like, so for example, um, there's this really um, amazing philosopher of religion who uh, does, Christ she works in Christianity, and she um, was actually part of the church uh, for most of her adult life, but she has very different views on the afterlife than the church does, right? So philosophy, the reasoning that she arrived at through philosophy has showed her that the Christian conception of God could not possibly allow for hell, right? The traditional conception of hell to even exist, right? The idea of permanently punishing someone, right? For all of eternity, right? Didn't fit logically, right? And that's another word that you should have a, a better understanding of now, right? <laughs> that's our second concept, logic this week, right? Logically, there was an inconsistency, right? So it couldn't be possible to have an all good God, right? That engaged in certain un, just objectively unjust practices, right? And this also, of course, is going to tie into Molly, what you mentioned, the problem of evil as well, right? How do we reconcile an all loving, all knowing, all powerful being, with the existence, not just of any evil, but so much, right? There seems to be like an excessive amount of suffering in the world, uh, maybe perhaps beyond what might be necessary, right? To achieve whatever, you know, we might think that maybe some evil is necessary, right? To bring about goodness, but like why so much, right? And so often you'll see uh, examples, you know, involving harm coming to children, because for some reason, that bothers us more than harm coming to adults. <laughs> so for some reason, we think like adults maybe deserved it in some way, but kids, the innocence of children, right? Uh, we tend to have more empathy for harm that comes to them, right? So again, it's just a different way of approaching the same questions. And on that note, I wanted to highlight something I mentioned in my announcement at the beginning of the course, which is that this class is very controversial, right? We're gonna be talking about a lot of religious traditions and doctrines and practices and views of um, not just women, but members of the LGBTQIA community, right? Um, so any anyone who diverges from what we might call traditional gender roles, right? So these types of views, um, these may or may not coincide with beliefs that you hold, right? They may or may not coincide probably very likely with beliefs that you that your family members hold, right? Or your friends or your community. And I wanna make it very clear that I am not at any point going to try to make you change what you believe, okay? <laughs> um, and this might sound terrible, but I, I wanna make it clear. I'm, I'm not super, sounds terrible. Like I'm not committed to an interest in what your current beliefs are. I'm more interested in what, why you have those beliefs, right? What made you arrive 
at that belief because it's that process that philosophy is concerned with, right? So again, I'm not trying to convert anybody. <laughs> I'm not going to try to make you all atheists, right? Whatever, you know, kind of warnings or uh, concerns you may have had, <laughs> right? Your beliefs are your own and you are entitled to them and you're not going to get any challenges about them from me. The only thing I will ask you to explore and to perhaps even question in yourself is just, again, how did I arrive at this belief, right? Where did it come from? And this is important to do with all of our beliefs, not just those about religion, right? And this leads us into, of course, the uh, fourth element of this, this week, which is the notion of feminist philosophy, right? Um, and how feminism is specifically going to operate uh, in terms of assessing philosophy of religion. So that's, we talked a little bit about philosophy. There's a lot going on with logic, right? Even what is religion, okay? And then how feminism is going to inform that, okay? So real quick, let's take about um, five to 10 minutes, um, maybe closer to five, hopefully, um, on questions you have about logic. So I wanted to let you know that I kind of gave you like a crash course in logic. <laughs> logic is a whole class, right? So there's there's a lot more time that you all are going to need unless you already have a background in logic, right? So don't expect to know all that stuff just over one week, okay? This is a skill we're going to be learning throughout the class, but it's going to be a framework to help us ensure that when we construct arguments for our positions, whatever those may be, that we are going to be constructing the strongest possible version of that argument, right? And so it's going to be important for us to know the difference between induction and deduction, right? So uh, in the chat, really quickly, why don't you type out which type of arguments are stronger or make a, a better case for their conclusion, deductive or inductive arguments? You can type it in the chat. Good. All right. So I'm not sure who I can call on who has a uh, microphone capabilities. I might just pick on those people who have already spoken or have their cameras on. So Helen, uh, do you have a sense of why deductive arguments are better or stronger or make a, a more convincing case for their conclusions than inductive arguments? So deductive means that it like has to like necessarily entail its conclusion while inductive like just generally supports the conclusion. Good, right? So it's in terms of what these arguments are trying to do. Now, of course, arguments can be unsuccessful, right? We, we can, uh, you know, construct them in, in what we might call an invalid way, right? Or um, maybe use language that weakens it in some sense. But yes, overall, deductive arguments are trying to guarantee their conclusion, like you said, beyond a doubt. Whereas inductive arguments are only ever able to make probabilistic support or provide probabilistic support for their conclusion. And what's really fascinating is once you start to realize what that means in terms of us knowing things, right? We consider knowledge to be something that is true, right? But most of our knowledge comes from inductive reasoning, right? So how many of you think you know that the sun is going to rise tomorrow? Show of hands. Do you know that the sun is going to rise tomorrow? But do you know it or is it only just likely? <laughs> what do we think? Um, based on the fact that everything we know about space is based on physics, which is essentially a bunch of inductive arguments, um, I would say that it, 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 there's a strong likelihood, but it's a likelihood. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So every day it gets stronger, right? Every day that we get more conf confirmation of the theories, right? Absolutely in physics. But yeah, these are all based on inductive reasoning, right? So why do we think that the sun will rise tomorrow? Well, because it's risen every day in the past. Why do we think that the future will be like the past? Well, because the future's always been like that. But that doesn't necessarily guarantee, right? We don't actually have knowledge of the future, right? It's, un it's an unknown. We haven't experienced it yet, right? So we can't actually know or guarantee that the sun will rise tomorrow. We can just make an inductive inference, right? That the sun will rise tomorrow. And most of our scientific knowledge is like that, right? You'll see that um, the success of certain medical procedures, of certain medications work, it's always in terms of probability, right? They're always going to be outliers, always exceptions. So, right, when 
we're working in the, the realm of religion, because we're dealing with so many things that are beyond the physical realm, you're going to see a lot more focus on deductive arguments, right? Because people are going to be wanting to making sweeping generalizations, right? We're not going to say, well, God existed yesterday, but we don't know if God will exist tomorrow, right? The idea is that we're, we're not necessarily subject to the laws of physics, when it comes to religious doctrine, right? And so we're going to want to encourage deductive reasoning in philosophy of religion, as opposed to inductive, because we don't have to necessarily, you know, force it to rely on, again, the physics and the way things have been, right? But we're moving beyond that in a sense, especially again, in terms of things like an immortal soul, right? Some people have tried to find empirical evidence for this, right? But the idea is that any argument to try to convince someone that there is a soul is probably not going to rely on empirical evidence, right? The most convincing arguments will be more reason-based, right? And so that's that's why we're going to be fo focusing on deduction, all right? So um, this will come up with our paper. The, the main way that you'll want to focus on deduction is um, that you will have to you know, pick a topic for this class um, that you're going to write a paper on, and you're going to have to take a position on whatever topic you choose, and then you're going to have to create an argument for your position, right? And so your argument is going to have to be deductively valid, but again, there's a lot going on there, so I have uh, ar simple argument forms you can use, right, that you can kind of plug in your ideas just to follow the form to make sure it's valid. So I don't want you to stress too much about the logic stuff. I just want you to know that it's there as a framework to make sure that we're assessing reasons consistently, right? So we're gonna be using these tools of logic to help us assess arguments as well as construct our own, right? So we're sort of all playing by the same logic rules here, right? Um, that's the idea. Okay, um, so logic, philosophy, uh, the next two things that I wanna talk about are religion and feminism, right? Um, so there are a couple different ways to define religion, right? As, as you hopefully have gathered from, from the week's content. Um, there are two historically dominant ways of defining religion, but um, I tend to be more partial to um, the criteria-based assessment that we see from Ninian Smart, um, which is the idea that religion is no one thing, right? So if we define religion in terms of, you know, belief in the supernatural, that's going to exclude a lot of traditions, right, that don't necessarily have deities and things like this, right? Um, so it's a little bit too narrow to capture all the traditions that we wanna consider religion. But we have other types of um, definitions like the belief in something sacred, which might be a little bit too broad, right? Because things are considered sacred that have nothing to do with religion. Can any of you think of anything that's considered sacred that is totally secular, not religious, but still considered sacred? I would assume things like the Declaration of Independence is something as Americans we can quote unquote consider sacred, which is absolutely and, and should have nothing to do with yeah, religion. Right. No, I know, but people right nationalism almost ends up becoming like a religion for some people, right? Because it has so many similar elements, right? And so yeah, same thing with uh, sports, even, right? Some things are considered sacred, so you can see that. On the one hand, these simplistic definitions, right, that just make religion one thing, tend to either be too narrow, right, and they exclude some things that we want to consider religions, or they're too broad, and they kind of make everything a religion, right? So there's, again, philosophy, there's no clear one answer. We're going to be looking at lots of answers. It's up to you to choose which one sits best with you, or maybe you just start dissatisfied with all of them, and you need to come up with something new. That works too, right? So we have a couple different options here, but um, we are definitely going to be focusing, obviously, on the particular element um, that Ninian Smart focuses on, which he calls the philosophical dimension, right, <laughs> of these religious traditions. And we're going to be looking at how they view, of course, people in specific gender roles. And what that means in terms of their ability to achieve whatever the goal in that religion is, right? Whether it's eternal paradise, whether it's enlightenment, right? Whatever that thing is, your embodied identity is going to have a very real impact according to most major religious traditions as to whether or not you are likely to achieve that goal, right? And um, I'll just give you a heads up, <laughs> right? Uh, even though this class is not just going to be focusing on women, the reason it's called Women in World Religions is because 
these individuals among, along with those who are, again, outside of the binary, right? So not identifying as man or woman, right? But something that is uh, more pluralistic. These individuals historically have not been viewed as capable, right? So it's seen as an inherent quality because of their identity, that they are not capable, right? They don't have whatever characteristics that religion says they need to have in order to achieve, again, enlightenment, eternal paradise and whatnot, right? And this has a lot of philosophical grounding, which is why we're going to see feminist philosophers come in to do a lot of this critical work, because they're building off of some of the work specifically that comes from feminist epistemology. Um, and just to let you know, the idea there is that the notion of being reasonable, right, a rational person, and how much that's connected with being a moral person or a good person has historically been gendered as a masculine character trait, right? And so if we have historically associated religion, or sorry, uh, rationality and morality with being a man, right, that's going to have clear indications about what it means to be a woman, right? People might presume that you are irrational, right? or more emotional, right? It's even the opposition to reason, right? So emotion, and then of course the opposite of morality in religious language would be not just evil, but sin, right? <laughs> okay, these end up being associated primarily with the feminine, right? And I'm sure we can all think of lots of examples already from religious stories, right? That are going to reinforce these ideas. Not all of them will, right? These are these are not gen, you know generalizing rules because again even within one religious tradition we're going to see a lot of variety and again it changes over time so a lot of religious traditions are trying to change these associations right but we want to look at how these types of associations with gender and characteristics are going to impact the way a specific religious tradition views people with those identities okay. And one of the things I like about feminist theology in particular is that they provide lots of different possible ways to respond to a problem, right? So let's say we're dealing with some particular religious tradition and we encountered a problem, or it's a problem for us at least, right? With the way that they describe or view a particular identity, okay? Again, they're not just going to say, give up on the religion, run away, right? <laughs> Become an atheist. That's not, <laughs> that's not what they're proposing, right? Like any good philosophers, we want to explore a possibility, a range of possible solutions, okay? And so these can be sort of boiled down into three main possible ways of responding to problems, right? So I want to lay this out for us before we even get into what these problems are so that we don't feel stuck when we encounter them. Okay, so we know there are options. The first one is to, uh, or the first two really, are about remaining within the religion, right? So even if you identify a problem, right, you don't necessarily need to separate yourself entirely from that tradition, right? And so when you remain within the religious tradition, there are two options. One is in terms of passage, passage interpretation. Right, so the way we interpret problematic passages from religious texts or doctrines. Many of you are probably aware that these texts were not originally written in whatever language right, you've read them in, <laughs> right? You, most of them, uh, with the exception of the Quran, uh, have been translated over and over and over again, right, into many different languages. And for any of you who speak more than one language, you know the issues with translation, right? So just because you have a word in one language does not necessarily mean that you will be able to find the word that means the same thing in another language, right? And this is all based on whoever happens to be interpreting the text at that time and whatever word they choose to, you know, to translate it. So one way of addressing these problems is going back to the as as original as one could possibly get right finding the oldest versions of the text and reinterpreting the language right um to try to address these problems okay so reinterpreting passages to avoid the problems is one possible avenue the second option is about the fact that most people within a religious tradition don't tend to always believe everything that that religious tradition 
says is true, right? Most people tend to favor certain beliefs over others, right? Or they tend to pick and choose kind of which ones work for them and which ones don't. And so presuming that that's allowed, right? Of course, we might take issue with that. <laughs> but presuming that um, it's okay, right? To pick and choose which parts of a religious tradition we highlight, you could try to replace problematic passages with passages that are less problematic, right? So kind of highlighting the less problematic aspects of a religious tradition um, over the others. So less problematic passages, okay? So these are the two options that feminists um, talk about. If you're interested in addressing a problem, a potential problem that a religious tradition has, but are not interested in leaving that tradition, right? All right. The third option is about potentially leaving the institution, so leaving the religious institution. But again, this need not necessarily mean giving up the beliefs, right? It might just mean that the problems you identified are not necessarily with the religion itself, but with the system that human beings have developed around that tradition, right? So you might hear a lot of people say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, right? They're referring to something that's more individualistic, right? Not necessarily a larger institution and system that they are participating in where um, there's gonna usually be a hierarchy, right? Authority figures. And so one can leave the institution, but still embark on either uh, participating in a newer religious tradition, which we'll explore toward the end of, towards the end of the quarter, right? Um, a lot of the newer religions tend to be mix, mixtures of older traditions. And so they have been constructed intentionally to avoid some of the historical problems, right? So we'll see that, especially when we get to Sikhism and the Baha'i tradition, as well as um, the reinvigoration of um, Wiccan traditions, right? And new age uh, uh, schools of thought. So, right, the idea is that it, we can still maintain the benefits of participating within a religious tradition without some of the problems that might come from the institution itself. So newer religious traditions, or again, some more personal form of spirituality. Okay, so these are the three main options that feminist theologians are going to give us. And of course, in actuality, they could look, you know, many different ways. But just so you know, when we encounter a problem, that doesn't mean that we have to, you know, scrap, or I hate that phrase, like throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is there, is there any better for saying than that? What can we throw the garbage out with? I don't know, but, you know, right? We don't want to scrap the whole thing because they're, right? Just as with things that are problematic, there are also going to be many wonderful teachings that we're going to be able to get from these religious traditions, right? So how do we navigate the problems without sacrificing the benefits that we think these traditions might bring to people? All right, so we have about three minutes left of class. Um, I want to leave this and I, I'm happy to stay um, a little bit longer uh, after class for those of you who are able as well to answer any more questions. But so let's start off with questions about um, feminism in particular, because I know that feminism doesn't have the best uh, PR campaign <laughs> historically. Right. Um, I, I'll never forget my first teacher who talked about feminism. She's like, we're not all out in the woods burning our bras. Like, that's not right. This, like, let's get rid of some of the stereotypes about feminists as being like man hating, you know, <laughs> just these angry people. Right. There's just I'm sure you're all familiar with the negative stereotypes, but we want to understand feminism broadly as being committed to addressing historical inequities for everybody. Now, feminism has not always been interested in the injustices that affect everybody, but it's trying to be, right? So feminism definitely started off very white, upper middle class, right? So focusing on helping a very small percentage of the population. But it's become so inclusive over the, the generations that now feminists are very even much involved in environmental ethics, right, animal, where, uh, animal welfare, right, connecting the injustices that women have experienced with lots of other groups, right, that have been marginalized. And so we want to be charitable, and we want to try to work with as an inclusive view as possible, but I want to leave space for us to, to ask questions about feminism and maybe clarify some misconstruals we've had. 
any questions, you can unmute yourself. You can raise your hand as a gesture or on your video. Might be a self-selection. You are probably all a little bit more, uh, have more positive views of feminism than people who wouldn't sign up for this class, but. <laughs> Any questions about it out there? No? All right, how about religion? Questions about what it means to be a religion? What might constitute something as a religion? This one always interests me because I don't know about you, I'm really interested in cults. So I think they're fascinating. Um, I try to watch like every single documentary series there is about cults. And I don't know how many of you, again, if you've had a chance to look at Ninian Smart's criteria, the dimensions, the seven dimensions, Cults fit all of those, right? And every major religion that we're going to study was at one point considered an occult practice, right, before it became a major institution, right? So it's funny that we now want to say, like, well, Scientology is not a religion or these other things aren't religions. But we want to kind of pick up, if we can, the similarities there, right? And then if, if we do think there's a difference, we have to identify what the difference is, right? Yeah, Molly. So there are a couple things at play here, right? There's the way in which religious traditions have responded to people who we might think exhibit um, or display characteristics that we would currently classify as mental illness, right? And so historically, this often comes up in terms of um, oh, uh, epilepsy, most often, right? So people who have um, conditions where they often go have seizures. These have been historically considered to be moments of exactly what you're talking about, right? Some sort of spiritual out-of-body experience from which the individuals might gain religious knowledge. And so not only have these religious traditions historically held up people who have these conditions, but they also are very much against the medicalization or treatment of them, right? Because the idea is that if you treat the symptoms, you're going to be losing out, right, on the spiritual knowledge and, uh, you know, other things that are gained from that. Um, the other thing, of course, it goes the other way too, right, with um, schizophrenia and like exorcisms, right? So people who are displaying signs of mental illness and that is misconstrued in the language or um, metaphysics of the religion, right? So if you think that, you know, someone speaking nonsense and behaving in a particular way is a sign of demonic possession, right? You're going to respond to them or treat them in a very different way than if you were responding to something you viewed as a medical problem, right? Um, yeah, so it's, it's very fascinating, uh, the history between religion and mental illness, but I think that too hopefully is evolving over time. I, again, I would hope, but this also goes to the relationship between religion and science, right? And of course, one need not see those as incompatible with each other, but unfortunately, historically, they have been viewed that way. It's a great question. All right, I know we're a little past time, but again, I'm happy to hang out for those of you who have to go. I will see you next week. Um, if you can uh, participate via your camera or the chat, I just want to make sure that um, in the future I can get to all of your questions and I don't uh, just favor those who have their cameras on. So I apologize for those of you who I didn't get to chat with today. But again, email me if you'd like to talk during office hours um, or if you have questions you just want me to answer over email. And again, I'm happy to remain for those uh, who still have some questions. But for those of you who have to go, I'll see you next week. I would like definitely encourage emails. you to go through the, the media if you haven't had a chance to okay. already, because there's a lot of stuff that I've provided in there to directly help contradict some of those misconceptions. Like the feminist movement has done a lot for men's safety and health. Um, especially in terms of um, issues of mental health and sexual assaults, right, and trauma, um, even to the way that they're cared for in, in prison and in the incarceration system. Um, so, yeah, feminism as being anti-male is, is one of those misconstruals we definitely want to, to change, especially because when you really understand what the way feminists view existing society, they don't think that all men have this privilege over women, right? It's actually the hierarchy is like any pyramid where it's a very small percentage of people at the top, right? Who have power and privilege over the rest. Now, historically that has tended to be white males, but that's an oversimplification, right? It's white males from upper middle class, heterosexual, right? Identity to pr 
predominantly Christian, right? So there are all these other elements that go into that as well. And so we want to avoid sort of these broad sweeping generalizations that can be used against feminism that way, right? So it's not that all men have power and privilege, right? Over all women, there are always gonna be exceptions, but you know that doesn't mean that we can't note patterns throughout human history. And one of the things you'll notice in the PowerPoint is that there are two things you have to commit to to be a feminist. One is a descriptive claim about the way things are, and one is a normative claim about the way things ought to be, right? And so the descriptive claim is that people are treated differently because of their identity, right? Which doesn't seem like too radical a thing, but some people definitely don't think that that's true, right? A lot of people say like, oh, racism is over and oh, women are doing so well. So there's no more sexism anymore, right? Like a lot of people just deny the existence of these inequities. So they deny the descriptive claim, right? So they think, oh yeah, I, I think things should be equal but I think they already are. <laughs> and so that's one way to not be a feminist. The other way to not be a feminist is to accept the descriptive claim. Yeah, things are unjust, but deny the normative claim and say, well, they're supposed to be unequal, right? A lot of people are very much committed to the idea that pe because people are so different and varied in their skill sets and all of these other ways, that some people belong in lower places on the hierarchy, right? So you can either disagree with the descriptive claim or the normative claim. And if you disagree with either of them, you wouldn't be considered a feminist, right? So a feminist has to be committed to both of those things. But outside of that, feminists disagree on all types, or <laughs> pretty much on everything else, right? Those are really the only two things that feminists have in common. But there's a lot more that we could say within that. Um, but I, yeah, definitely want to get past the idea that it's just about hating groups because that is that kind of undermines, I think, the purpose of you know why feminism began, which is like I don't I think people think that they want to switch the power dynamic, right? Like, okay, men were in charge for so long, now we need women in charge. Like, yes, we need women in charge, but feminists are just looking for parity. <laughs> They're not looking to reverse the role, right? They're just looking to have equal representation at the table and not just for women, right? But having as many diverse voices at the table as possible. Um, so yeah, I hope the media uh, is is helpful in that. But of course, um, you know, dealing with family is different. And sometimes people are not going to be very receptive. And so one issue you might encounter in this class is that you might want to talk about these ideas with family members who are not going to be able to engage in them dispassionately, right? Because for most people, right, religious beliefs are so personal. And so again, when, when those questions get asked, people often take it as a threat, right? And they feel like they're being attacked. And so part of, you know, learning to engage in this work is learning how to be tactful about how we ask these questions, which is really hard. You know, I'm still figuring out how to how to do that myself, because it depends on who you're talking to, right? And how well you know them and what your rapport is and all these, right? What mood they're in that day, <laughs> all, all types of things. But um, I do want to let you know that unfortunately, having those deep conversations might not be possible with everybody in your life. So be prepared for that. But um, hopefully, this will at least give you a space and a community to engage in that that dialogue if, if with no one else. Um, and we're going to be doing a project later on in the quarter tied to our paper, um, where you're going to have to actually have a dialogue with someone who disagrees with you in real life. Um, and so that will also be good practice for this because you'll have done a lot of research ahead of time. And so hopefully you'll be more confident entering into those spaces where you know there's going to be disagreement and conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you some tips on how to you know, mitigate that and, and make sure that it doesn't become a hostile situation. Um, you know, one thing I will say that I found very helpful is the, the traditional Socratic method, right? Which is the idea of not attacking someone's views, but just start off by agreeing with them and then asking them very strategic questions to try to get them to arrive at the realization that there's something problematic with their views. <laughs> So if you are interested in, again, just tacts and strategies for that, the Socratic method is a very good one, uh, in my opinion. It, it tends to work very well because if people think you're agreeing with them, their defenses come down <laughs> and then they're more willing to engage and talk with you about these things. This is for the first two chapters that I've scanned. 
Um, unfortunately, I don't think the publisher has an ebook of this. Mm -hmm. About that, you'll have to go to that I have linked in the syllabus, but the last time I checked, I don't think they had an electronic version. I apologize about that. Um, in the library. And so if you're preferring a PDF, you might be able to ask a librarian to scan it for you. That's probably what I'm a little bit more inclined to do that, even despite, you know, copyright infringement, <laughs> just, um, you know, because of the pandemic and not everyone's able to yeah, get no. to the bookstore. Very so, good. yeah, I, I would maybe see if they're willing to do that. I see. I didn't get to talk about uh, today just because we had so much to get through. But um, yeah, so the paper is actually um, scaffolded. So it's broken up into really small, manageable pieces that we will be working on throughout the quarter. So we're going to start off by picking our topic, right? then just do a little research, right? Construct a little annotated bibliography. Then you're gonna get a bunch of feedback on that. Then we'll get a chance to revise that topic if we want. Then we take a position and construct our argument, we're gonna get feedback on that, right? So we're just gonna slowly build and add the pieces over time. So by the end of the quarter, your paper will already be written. It will just be a matter of editing it, right? Making final decisions uh, based on the feedback that you've gotten throughout the course. So um, yeah, I, I hate the model of like, you've got this paper due at the end of the quarter and it's just going to show up at, right? Like nothing. Well, and that. I... Perfect opportunity to help cultivate some of those skills, right? Because you won't have to worry so much about what you submit because you know it's not just a rough draft it's a rough 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 <laughs> draft that you're going to have you know 10 opportunities to change so uh less pressure fewer stakes hopefully when the work is submitted and plenty of time to uh to improve it right and hopefully by you know part of the reason i assigned peer review work is that when i was in school it actually helped me become a better writer right being able to spot mistakes in other people's work helped me be more critical of my own writing and so or like the opposite so like oh they did that thing really well I can try that you know in my so that I think is going to help help you kind of figure out your writing style and maybe hone in um uh 